Hello Internet, Seth Skorkowski, and today we're going to talk about Game Master mistakes. Game Mastering is a big job, and there are a wide array of pitfalls and errors that even the most well-intentioned and sometimes the most seasoned of Game Masters can fall into. Now previously I've done a video on 7 deadly Game Master sins, and then another video on 7 more sins, and since neither of those could cover them all, it is time to revisit it. And of some stupid skits. That's right. Now. As I have said before, I have personally committed every single one of these sins at some point or another over the last 25 years of game mastering. Eh, what can I say? No one's perfect. No making mistakes does not make a game master bad. The key is to learn from those mistakes and correct that behavior in the future. Now, without any further introduction, 7 Game Master Sins, Part 3. That's 21 for those of you that are counting. Number 7, Loot Fairy. Okay, after killing the six kobolds, you find their treasure. It's 15,000 gold, two plus two longswords, a vorpal axe, a cloak of invisibility, and plus two dwarven plate mail. Only plus twos? Damn, I've already got plus threes. Yeah, my axe is already pretty good, but you guys mind if I take that vorpal one as a backup? Nah, go ahead and hold on to it. But the rest of the plus two crap we should totally keep. That way when we get that fortress, when we reach fourth level, we can decorate all the walls with it. One fun part of being a game master is rewarding your players with all sorts of cool items, whether that be magical items, great technology, or just lots and lots of money that they can then use, and become more powerful, and that can help them kind of achieve their goals in the future adventures and make them more awesome. Loot Fairy Game Masters are ones that then take that to the extreme, showering the player characters with just excessive amounts of it, which in turn makes all those items sort of lose their impact because now they're just kind of raining from the sky and it's going to throw your game balance just completely out of whack. Most players are not going to mind or argue with getting inordinate high amounts of treasure, but in the long run, it's not going to give them the same satisfaction as it would as if they were slowly amassing all of that treasure and all that fortune over time. Many game systems have little charts of recommended levels of loot that you should give your player characters for whatever type of encounter it is. Game masters should use those recommended tables and of course definitely use some common sense and not make every adventure a ridiculous Monty Hall. Number 6. The Obvious Object In searching the dead butler's body, you find a key. I'm gonna try it out on the gun safe. Doesn't fit. How about the basement door? Nope. I bet it's the china cabinet. Doesn't work there. Damn, where could it fit? Okay, so we have tried every door and every piece of furniture in the mansion, as well as checked the girlfriend's apartment and then checked the bank safety deposit box. I give up. I, I just can't do this anymore. You want to give up? Fine. You never checked the car. Wait, what? That was a car key? Yeah. Dude, car keys don't look like normal keys. We should have known that the moment we found it. You never asked me what it looked like? An obvious object is when the Game Master holds back some important piece of information that should have been completely obvious to the player characters up front. But now the Game Master is requiring that the PCs specifically look for it or ask about it, often without knowing that they're supposed to be looking for something at all. The players, either missing the clue that they were supposed to ask or not asking because there was no clue given, end up wasting an incredible amount of game time or they could possibly put their characters in some sort of dire situation simply because they didn't know better. Now, these are not objects that are obvious and they should have had some sort of observation or perception or awareness or whatever your game system calls it sort of check. This is something that's so obvious that no skill should ever be needed. Something like a mushroom cloud blooming on the horizon, or the fact that the person you're talking to is a giant wicked scar going across their face. We're talking about painfully obvious things. Now sometimes this just happens by honest mistake. Hey, no Game Master is perfect, and most of the time a Game Master could just correct this and avoid any frustration or errors that this causes by just going ahead and offering that information to the player characters the moment they realize that they forgot to give it to them initially. But the problem itself escalates when the Game Master is also guilty of the sin of... Number 5. Not throwing a bone. 
Sometimes the players miss a clue, and the game is stalled as a result of that. Maybe they all failed to find that secret door, or maybe they all failed to ask that one question of that one PC in that one town, that one thing that they needed to know in order for the game to get back to moving forward. It might have been dice, it might have been Game Master error, it might be the players and didn't do that one specific thing at that right time they were supposed to do it. Whatever caused the game to stall, that's not the issue. The sin happens when the Game Master allows the game to continue being stalled because they're waiting for the player characters to meet some very specific requirement, even though it has become painfully obvious to everyone that that requirement is not going to be met. Now, this is something that's most common with Game Masters who are just overly rigid to the adventure as it was originally planned. Doesn't matter if they wrote the adventure themselves, they're going by an adventure module, if they're just going to stick to the adventure no matter what, and now the game has ground to a complete halt as a result of that. If the PCs don't find that one clue in that one spot, go ahead and move the clue somewhere else. Or add a clue somewhere else that might send them back to the first spot where they missed the clue, but it's basically telling them they should go back to that spot and look for the clue because that's where they're going to find it. If the PCs all missed that one secret door that they need to go through in order for them to go through the rest of the dungeon or whatever it is, and they all missed it, maybe have them hear voices going on the other side of it. Some NPC is telling a joke and they can hear laughter coming from the wall. And now that they know that there is some sort of secret door there, and they can get a chance to check for it again. Or you could just have some unsuspecting NPC open up that secret door from the other side and come strolling through it, and all of a sudden, like, either the PCs hide from them, or they're like, oh, oh my god, there's people here, and something happens there as a result. Now, that might be a combat, or it might be that the player characters have lost the element of surprise because now all the bad guys know that they're there. Whatever it is, doesn't really matter. What's important is that the game is back to moving forward because the player characters are through that secret door, or whatever the obstacle is that's stalling the game. Now, the Game Master does not, and probably shouldn't, actually just hand them so the solution outright. Players don't like being handed the solution, and Game Masters, that they, they don't like to just offer a solution freely over. So nobody actually wants that. The Game Master should first attempt to change the problem in order for the player characters to solve it. And hopefully, the players around the table are never going to realize that you changed the game in order to accommodate them so that they could solve it. They're just going to think that that's how the game was, and they solved it, and nothing ever went wrong. There's a thousand situations where something is going to stall the game, but there's just as many ways that a game master can help throw them a bone and get the game back on track and back to everyone having fun. Number four, favoritism. Sirens blare as the gunship comes cresting up above the top of the building, and missiles start spewing out of the rocket pods that are slung under each side, and it blows the shack that you're hiding in to pieces. Mike, you take 28 points of damage and it blows your legs completely off. Well, I'm dead. Dweebles, you take 33 points to the head. Well, there went that character. Todd, you take four points of damage to the torso, which is then completely stopped by your Kevlar vest. Awesome! It's not gonna last. I don't have any weapons that can take out that gunship. Oh, well, in the burning wreckage of the shack, you see this crate that's spilled open, and inside of it is a heat-seeking rocket launcher you can use. Seriously? What? Dweebles and I both died again. He don't even get a scratch in that, and there weren't no missile launcher inside that shack when we checked it earlier. But now that Todd needs one, oh, there it is. Yeah, I just lost my third character, but he hadn't taken any damage this entire campaign. This is bullcrap. As I said in a previous video, most Game Masters are going to have a favorite player. There's no harm in that. But giving perks to your favorite player, now that is when we have a problem. Not only is it going to be completely obvious to everyone at the table that that one player is getting all sorts of undue perks and rewards that nobody else is getting, but it's going to piss off all of the other players at the table because of that. But it's also going to hurt the player that's getting those perks because it's possibly going to embarrass them, make them question if their accomplishments were real or not, if they actually achieved whatever it was they were trying to do because they were awesome or because they were handed the answer, but can also make them the target for all the other players' resentment that the fact that you have chosen them to be the favorite player at the table, and that isn't fair to them. Chances are that your players already know who your favorite player is, and they are going to notice that when fortune just seems to keep befalling them and not everyone else. 
Game masters need to be aware of that, and they need to make sure that they are not accidentally showing favoritism to their favorite player. But they also need to make sure that it's very clear that they're not showing favoritism to their favorite player, because if everyone else at the table, or even the favorite player, begins to perceive that there's favoritism, even when there isn't any, the results can still be the same as if you were showing it to them. Number three, not reading the room. This is a huge one. A Game Master's highest priority, according to the RPG Social Contract, is to provide a fun and entertaining experience for all the players at the table. And to do that, a Game Master needs to learn how to read all of their responses. That means that they should be planning their games around what you know and what you think is going to interest your players. And then during the session, recognizing when one or more of your players begins to become bored, become irritated, or maybe when they show a lot of interest in something that you weren't anticipating. And either you can heighten that up in this game and because that's already got their interest, or you can make a note and then sort of center another game around that thing that you now know is something that they're kind of interested in. Learning how to read your players and learning how to adjust the game in order for their preferences and kind of working around that is one of the most important skills that a game master can ever learn. In fact, most of the problems that a game master is going to encounter due to committing any of the game master sins or anything like that could easily be corrected by just simply learning how to read the room and how to adjust everything because they can read their players' faces. Now, there are a few different ways that you can learn how to do this. There's not going to be any single catch-all way. We are all different. The dynamic of my group works work work differently than the dynamic of everyone else's group, but there are a few good ways that we can talk about. First, talk to your players. Get feedback from them after the game. Find out what they liked. Find out what they didn't like. Find out anything that they're looking forward to. Find out anything that they're kind of dreading because they might think something's going to happen. And whether you're intending that or not, find out what that is. Find out what their tastes are and try to gear the game around that sort of taste. But also, if they say they were bored at the game, remember back what they looked like at the time. Because second, you need to learn what it is, what their tells are. Kind of like playing poker. Now, the other thing is don't get tunnel vision during the course of the game. Don't spend most of your time just looking down behind your sheet. Or if you're talking to that one player, you know, you're going back and forth and you're doing a, you know, a thieves run or something like that and ignoring what's going on at the rest of the table. Look up from the middle of that conversation that you're having with another player. Look around and see if you still have everyone else's interest and everyone else is still into the game and they're not becoming bored or they're not becoming frustrated or anything like that, and that you are keeping them entertained. Number two, no consequences. After an exhaustive search of the door, you don't find any traps. Okay, then I open the door. It's trapped. Damn it! Okay, well how dead am I? How bad is the damage? No damage. The mechanism that launched the spear was jammed with corrosion and age, and the deadly point of that spear just stopped millimeters from your eye. Awesome! I open the door. Dude, you forgot to check for traps. A trap goes off and you fall into a spiked pit for one point of damage. Oh, well that wasn't so bad. You come to the door. Warnings are all painted across it in blood. Above the door is an array of hanging spikes and blades and cauldrons of boiling acid. I open the door. Scalding acid comes raining down atop you as sharp blades come flying down, punching holes in your armor and through your bodies. Okay, well, how bad are we hurt? Um, you're all reduced to one hit point. What about my armor and my backpack? All your gear is perfectly fine. Sweet! Time to go to work, healer. <sighs> I'm on it. Player characters should face some sort of risk during their careers. Whether that risk be of death, loss of items, imprisonment, banishment, or whatever it is, the player characters and the players need to fear those consequences. For a wide array of reasons, a game master might need to lower those consequences from time to time. No big deal, we've all been there. The problem becomes when the game master becomes excessive and how much they lower those consequences. Notice how excessive is a word that I use for a lot of these sins. If you threaten consequences but never follow through on them, the player characters and the players are going to stop fearing them. This not only hurts how they play, becoming no longer concerned with any sort of consequences whatsoever, but it also diminishes their own feeling of accomplishment once they've succeeded in whatever mission it is they're doing. Players need to believe that your threat of consequences is 100% real, and often that means that you're going to need to follow through on them. 
Otherwise, they're going to stop looking for traps. They're never going to strategize before they go charging off into combat. Or they're not going to think twice about just walking up to the Grand High King and insulting him to the face because they know that no, they're not going to get banished or thrown in jail or challenged to a duel or anything because nothing bad ever happens to them, no matter how much they do stupid things. But they do stupid things because you have enabled them to. Number one, forgetting that life happens. Hey dude, I'm really sorry about this, but I'm gonna have to miss the game today. We were just getting ready to start. Why are you bailing out? Yeah, my boss's wife went into labor, so he called me in to cover his theft. Well, tell him no. Why should we suffer because of his baby? I'm really sorry, dude. I would totally be there if I could. Yeah, you said that last time, but you've missed three games in a row now. Dude, the last time was a funeral. My Mima died. And did missing the game for her funeral bring her back to life? No. So now we all had to mourn her. And what about the time before that? I was in a hostage situation. Oh, it is always something with you, isn't it? Just letting everyone down. You know, you are truly the most selfish person I have ever known. Gaming is an important part of many of our lives, and juggling schedules for everybody to make it to a session isn't always easy, and it becomes harder the older you get and the more things that life has to throw your way. But sometimes a player just can't make a session or they need to leave early. It might be medical reasons, might be family, work, whatever it is, life happens. Now, I'm not talking about that flake player, which many people recognize what that is. You know, the player that bails out of every other session because a cool TV show came on or something shiny caught their interest, so now they're canceling games on you all the time. No, that's a completely different matter, and a game master needs to learn how to recognize when a player just can't make a session due to the life getting in the way and then not holding it against that player because life happened to them. Trust me, most of the time in these cases, the player would much rather have made it to the game than rather having to deal with whatever happened and prevented them from getting to that game. There is no need for you as a game master to be a dick to them as well. Hey, thanks for watching. So what'd we miss? Any confessions you game masters out there want to make your own? Just hit us up in the comments below. After that, you know the drill, like, subscribe, all that fun stuff. But till next time, amigos, stay awesome.